In the last video, we looked at how to handle the situation when the expected values of the categories are equal. Now we're going to see how that process slightly changes when we expect those values to be unequal to each other. So example two says, as part of the mathematics assessment, eighth graders were asked about the frequency with which they used calculators while taking tests or quizzes. The results for national public schools were as follows. 28% said never, 51% said sometimes, and 21% said always. A random sample of 140 eighth grade students in a large urban school district indicated that 30 said never, 78 said sometimes, and 32 said always. Alpha is 0.05, and we want to answer the question, do these proportions differ from the national report? So there's a lot of information in that question, and it's not very organized. So what I would suggest doing, if they don't give you a table, you should make one for yourself. So let's go ahead and make a table so that we can organize all of that information. So I'm going to draw just a 3 by 3 table there. And then you're going to let the columns represent each one of the categories. So the categories are never, sometimes, and always. Okay, and this is going to help us, you know, organize our observed frequencies and our expected frequencies so that we can put them into our calculator. So remember the observed frequencies, that should be your first row, since that's going to go into L1. And then your expected frequencies should be your second row since that's going to go into L2. So the observed frequencies are the ones that come from that sample. So it said that from the random sample of 148th grade students, 30 said never, 78 said sometimes, and 32 said always. Now for the expected frequencies, we're going to use the percentages that they gave us. So for national public schools, it says that 28% say never. So what would we expect as far as that sample? Well, we would expect that 28% of the total of 140 would have said never. So we're going to have to figure out what 28% of 140 is, and that'll be the expected amount for the never category. So I'm just going to show my work in that box there. So 28% of 140 will do 0 0.28 times 140, which comes out to 39.2. And then we'll do the same thing for the other categories. So for the national public schools, it says that 51% say sometimes. So what would we expect as far as that sample? Well, we would expect that 51% of 140 would have said sometimes. So we'll do 0 0.51 times 140. That gives us 71.4. And then for always, it was 21%. So we'll do 21% of 140. So 0 0.21 times 140, which comes out to 29.4. OK, so let's go ahead and do our hypotheses. We'll get those out of the way. And then we'll worry about putting stuff into our calculator. So. The way we're going to state our null and alternative um, hypotheses for this type of situation, it's a little bit different. So for the null hypothesis, we are always going to make a statement like this. So we'll say that the distribution of students who use calculators on tests or quizzes is as follows. And then we're going to list what those percentages are. So you guys are kind of lucky because you're just going to do this online. So you're just going to probably pick from like drop down boxes. So you don't actually have to know like how to write these out yourself. But basically your null hypothesis, you're always just stating what the distribution is for whatever the circumstance in the question is. So the distribution of blah, blah, blah is as follows. And then you just kind of list what all of those percentages are. And then your null hypothesis it's always going to be the statement that the distribution is not as stated in the null. So that one will stay the same um, regardless of what the question is talking about. Okay, now we do have to figure out which one is our claim. So we're trying to answer the question, do these proportions differ? Okay, so does the distribution from the sample differ from the national report. So that would match what the alternative is saying. 
that the distribution is not as stated in the null, so we'll label the alternative as the claim. Now for step two, we need to get our chi-squared statistic, and we're gonna do that the exact same way as we did in the first video. So you need to put your observed frequencies into L1, your expected frequencies into L2, Okay, then go back to your home screen. Then you're gonna go to second stat, go over to math, go down to sum. Okay, select that. Then you'll open a parentheses, you'll type second one minus second two, close the parentheses, square it, divide by second two, close that parentheses, and hit enter, and then you should get, um, it's a long number, but go ahead and round, round your chi-square statistic to three decimal places, so you should get 2.999. Okay, then once you have that, then you're gonna use that to help you get your p-value. So your p-value is found by going to second bars, so you get your distributions, and then go down to chi-square CDF, Okay, and then you need to tell it the lower bound, the upper bound, and degrees of freedom. So the lower bound is always going to be whatever that chi-square value was, so 2.999. And then the upper, upper bound is never going to change. That's always positive infinity, so you're always going to put E99 there. And then you just have to remember that degrees of freedom for the goodness of fit test is the number of categories minus 1. So there were three categories in this question, so degrees of freedom is gonna be two. So you'll put a two into the, that last input spot. And then I'm actually gonna let you guys figure out what that value should be. I'll ask you that in the question in just a second. So see if you can get that P value. And then once you have that, steps three and four, we know how to do those. So. Step three, you're gonna compare that p-value with alpha. So I'll give you a hint, whatever it is, should come out to be greater than 0 0.05. So that means that we do not reject the null hypothesis. And then for step four, we'll state that there is not enough evidence to support the claim that the distribution is different from the one stated in the null hypothesis. 